Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our final conversation with forensic expert George Throckmorton, we'll talk about some behind-the-scenes conversations between prosecutors and defense attorneys and why it is that Mark Hoffman didn't get the death penalty for blowing up two people and attempting to kill a third. George will give us some behind-the-curtain look at, of some of these deliberations. Check out our conversation. I also want to remind everybody this is one of your last chances to sign up for the Gospel Tangents Insider Club. It will be July 17th, 2018 at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. So sign up at tinyurl.com slash gtinsider. We have limited seats available for this. It's going to be on Google Hangouts, but there's a limit on, on how many people can come. So please sign up right away so you don't miss out on this. It'll be a lot of fun. You can ask me questions and I'll tell a little bit more about the Mark Hoffman case. Now back to our conversation. What I understand is Mark Hoffman uh, pleaded guilty to second degree murder. And it seems like, at least, you know, I'm not an investigator, but it seems like he probably should have gotten first degree. There's a lot of premeditation going on and, and things like that. So why was there a plea bargain? Uh, you know, and I know he's gotten a big st stiff sentence anyway, even with second degree murder. But why did we plea bargain to, to second degree murder on this? Politics. It, it has always intrigued me the amount of politics that takes place in everything. Uh, and, and criminal investigations are the same thing. I remember that uh, Ted Cannon was the county attorney at that time, district attorney, and it was his feelings that any high profile case should go to court. And he was a firm believer in that. One of the prosecutors, however, is known for liking to make plea bargains. It's easier, it's simpler, you get a conviction, and that's really all that matters sometimes. The, uh, there was a meeting that took place that I was present to, and two other people were present to also. Before I get there, I forgot, Ted Cannon, in the process of the investigation, was so valuable. He was a printer before he became an attorney, so he gave us a lot of information on printed documents that were counterfeited and forged. And again, it was his belief to go to court so the public would be aware of all of the evidence. However, he got involved in a scandal in his office and he resigned early. Uh, the new district attorney uh, volunteered to come in early to take care of the office because he had won the election but hadn't been sworn in yet, so he volunteered to come in early. And uh, I met with him the day after he took office with one of the other attorneys, and he made the comment at the time, he said, George, as soon as, or he said, this is not my investigation. It's costing a lot of money. We don't have the funds. I want it to end. And he instructed the other attorney go out and make a deal and get this off the plate so we can get to our normal routine. And then he turned to me and he said, George, as soon as we get a plea, as soon as we get a conviction, you're going to be out of a job. We will no longer need you here. Now, the irony of that, I guess, is I had, had worked for the Attorney General's office to assist them with the case. And... Uh, after six months of assisting them, they called me in and said, we're not here to pay your salary to work for another agency. You've got to quit and come back and work for us. We've got work for you to do here. And I went and talked to Ted Cannon and told him that. And he says, we need you here. The investigation is going to last at least another year. And we can't do it without you. You're the only document examiner that knows these things. And so he offered me a job. He says, if you quit the Attorney General's office, and I'll hire you down here. Down here meaning? The District Attorney's office. Okay. And so I had a decision to make. Do I stay with the Attorney General and quit the Hoffman case? Or do I stick with the Hoffman case through completion, which was still going to be several more months than I knew of? I had looked at over 600 documents during that period of time. And although they were not going to be brought in the trial, 
it was still important for the overall investigation and the evidence. And I'm the only one that could do it. It's, it's awful to be in that situation, but honestly, nobody but me and Bill Flynn knew what we were doing. And Bill was in Arizona. So I made a decision. I resigned from the Attorney General's office and was hired at the District Attorney's office. And then it was like three months later, maybe four months later was when Ted left. And the new district attorney called me in and told me I was going to be laid off as soon as Hoffman pled guilty. So the follow-up is I was laid off on Valentine's Day, in fact, and uh, six years from retirement and had to start all over again. I was oh. a little frustrated on that. In yeah, fact, yeah. I had to go to San Diego because there was no job here for me at the time. But uh, so that's why the deal was made. The district attorney made the decision. He didn't want to continue the investigation, which was causing a lot of money. I know a lot of people have speculated about how the church was involved and we didn't want to call witnesses to the stand and all that other stuff. That's just total baloney. And that's the nicest words I can use. We had attorney, the, the, the wonderful thing about that investigative team that I really liked, we had a couple of good Mormons, if you will. We had a couple of anti-Mormons, if you will. We had some attorneys that wanted to fight. We had attorneys that wanted to deal. We had a diversity of people, and we had a lot of discussions. We had a lot of disagreements. You talked about the plea bargain that was made. Uh, in my opinion, and, and the opinion of most of the investigators there, it wasn't handled properly at all, but because there was instructions made to settle the case, period, it was settled before it should have been. And for instance, it's normal in law enforcement, if ever you make a plea bargain, the purpose is you get the confession from the person first, and if that person cooperates, then you go in and recommend the plea bargain. Because if you make the plea bargain first, the suspect has no reason to cooperate. And that's exactly what happened with Mark Hoffman. Mm. They made the deal before he was interviewed. And although the transcript of the interview, I think, is so thick, three, four inches thick, in fact, maybe even two books, I can't remember. The parts I read through, they're not 100% accurate. Some of them are outright lies, but who knows the difference? And see, for instance, the stipulation was that when Hoffman was to confess officially, that I would be present whenever we talked about the forgeries, that the homicide investigators would be present whenever he talked about the homicides. The fraud investigators would be present when he talked about his fraudulent activities. That never happened. <laughs> In fact, I was fired before he even had his confession. And so I was not even allowed to talk to him. But one of the attorneys that was there would come out to me and talk to me afterwards and said, as an example, just as an example, he said, Mark said that he got the paper from the Salamander letter in a book up at the University of Utah call such and such. I went up there, book wasn't there, there was no pages taken out of it. <laughs> it's just an outright lie. Now whether he intentionally lied or whether he just forgot because he's dealing in so many different documents, I don't know, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But I do know that many of the things that he said were inaccurate, they were not true. In his confession? In his confession. Hmm. But it was handled wrong. But in retrospect, looking back at it, I do not criticize the attorneys that I disagreed with because as we look back, because he did confess, the FBI had to admit that they were forged. <laughs> <laughs> and other people had to admit that he was a crook instead of an honest guy that we were framing, if you will. So overall, it turned out okay. But the accusations as to why are totally wrong. The LA Times, for instance, would talk about how the church was hiding documents all the time. They did. What we found out is Mark Hoffman was their secret snitch. He was feeding them that because it would escalate the price of a document <laughs> if it was controversial. They talk about the way the church hid documents. It just didn't happen. The one document President Hinckley hid, he didn't hide it. He was running the church at that time. He was overseas. He was doing so many things. He was working towards it. 
but the way they can distort things and the way they distorted the plea bargain. It was handled wrong in my humble opinion, but the results turned out okay. And Hoffman killed himself, if you will, when he went in the parole board. And they recommended that he be there without possibility of parole. Because otherwise, uh, he could have been given parole. His, Hoffman's attorney said, this is a first degree murder. They're going to execute him. And that's why he was willing to plea bargain too. So it's a complicated issue, but a lot of politics are involved anytime there's a plea bargain. Okay. Um, if you had, you know, if you could see Mark today, would you, what, what questions would you want to ask him? Quite frankly, none. None? I have no desire to see him. Uh, if I were to talk to him, he would lie to me anyway. Because he always did. I think he's, he's a pathological liar, I'm certain. I mean, he passed the polygraph machine up at the university. And that's an interesting story there because the professor up there didn't believe in the polygraph. He started researching it to write an article. He became a believer and became a polygraph examiner. And then Hoffman went up there and he passed with flying colors. Well, we know that because he's, he's a psychopathic liar. And he doesn't have any emotion. His family didn't know what he was doing. He could hide it from everybody. His parents, they didn't know what he was doing. They believed him 100%. He could lie to everybody. And if I were to talk to him, I don't know whether he would tell me his real name. <laughs> How do you think he passed that polygraph test? Because he's a pathological liar. And if you are, you can pass any polygraph. Hmm. If you think you're telling the truth, or if you don't... See, polygraphs, interesting thing on polygraph. I don't... I, I was working with the guy in Ogden who, for five years, that did it. We talked daily, every day, and we would compare notes. There was actually some research done on polygraph years ago, back in the 60s, where they hooked it up to a plant. I don't know if you heard about that or not. They hooked the polygraph up to a plant, and the plant emits, emits emotions which can be detected on the polygraph. It's an interesting story. You ought to read it sometime. And there's a movie on TV called Mythbusters. I, don't mm -hmm. know if you I love Mythbusters. They duplicated that really? about three years ago. Oh. Modified, but they duplicated. They found the same results. You hook that polygraph machine up to a plant, and when a dog walks in the room, it goes wild. <laughs> they had a caretaker that went in and cut his finger. The instance he cut his finger, the plant responded because that was the person that would talk to the plant and water the plant and so forth. The polygraph is very sensitive, but if you don't have a conscience, it doesn't work. Wow. So is that why they won't allow that as evidence in, in court? More or less. More or less. It's not 100% true because of the weakness of the polygraph operator. The machine is accurate. It's how it's interpreted that causes problems in the courtroom. Just like history how it's interpreted. <laughs> I mean, I go to an accident scene to do a reconstruction of an accident, and you have five witnesses, and they all tell a different story. Are they lying? No. But they don't see the same thing. It's from a different angle. Depending upon their past history is how they'll interpret it. And uh, so what you do, and that's why I like what I'm doing, you get all of their stories, put them together, and then it's like the pieces of a puzzle, and you put them together and it seems what's more logical. Is it 100%? Even DNA isn't 100%. Forensic science, do you know what the word forensic means? I used to know, but I can't remember. Debate. Debate. But because of a television program called Quincy, forensic pathologist, it changed the whole meaning of the word. Oh, wow. It now means the exam scientific examination of evidence. Because of a TV show? But it's forensic because it's debated in the courtroom. Oh. That's why you can always have opposing witnesses. Even documents, the study that's been done on handwriting examination, when you're properly trained, it's still only 96.4% accurate. So is it true that you can figure out a person's uh, characteristics just based on the way they write? Sure. You can find out, too, by the way the moon's in the sky and the stars are in the sky. Not. <laughs> I did some research years ago, which was published, which shows it's just baloney. 
I sent I sent four different writings to a well-known graphologist in Chicago, and and except I changed the name, one was a woman, one was a man, one was 25, one was 64, and they came back with contradictory traits, and it's the same handwriting they examined. Oh, really? So it's not a scientific analysis; it's whatever they do. I don't know. Like fortune telling. That's absolutely true. I didn't want to use that term, but yes. <laughs> wow! Wow! All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us here on Gospel Tangents. I may have to schedule another interview about Howard Hughes, though. <laughs> Maybe the hi-fi murders, too. So. <laughs> I'll tell you this. In my career, I've, I've worked in various places. I've been in Chicago and Washington and San Diego and Salt Lake and Ogden. And uh, it has been the most fascinating life that anybody could experience. I've met with uh, some of the smartest people in the professional organizations, uh, the American Academy of Forensic Science, the American Academy of Science, the International Association. There's thousands of members from all around the world, and I sit next to the scientists, and somebody will be talking about evolution as an example, and I'll be sitting next to the people. I'm, I don't know anything about it, but I'm talking to the people that do, and they'll say, that's not true, he's using the wrong equation here. They're using the wrong elements, and they're both arguing against each other. But what gets published? The guy that makes the presentation. <laughs> and I think that's why I enjoy it so much, because these are men of science. And uh, James Talmage, one of my favorite well-known scientists that's a member of the church, in one of his books, he said, a theory is there until eventually it's changed to a new theory, and that stays in effect until it's changed to a new theory. And I've, I've given presentations at times over the years, and I say there's two things I don't depend on. One is science and one is history. <laughs> the three things I like are magic, movies, and professional wrestling. You can depend on that because you get what you expect. <laughs> and I believe that 100%. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But I appreciate you asking me to talk. It's been my privilege. Yeah, it's been great. Um, before I let you go, what, are there any other really high-profile uh, cases that you worked on besides the ones that we've already mentioned? What do you want? Lafferty's? Uh, Lafferty's. You worked on that one? Hi-Fi Shop. Um, again, Howard Hughes. What's the other one? Guys you don't know of. Redmond is named for $173 million oh my. in Nevada. Uh, Shakespeare, the guy who wrote Shakespeare. That's enough. And Elizabeth Smart? Oh, I was the director of the lab when that happened. Yeah, oh, really? That was a fiasco. Hmm. And that was our fault. Hmm. That's interesting. That's an interesting story, which shouldn't have happened. But again, politics get involved. Mm hmm Wow. Well, we could have done better. We'll put it that way. We could have done a whole lot better with the crime scene portion of it, which in, in Ogden, when we went to the Hi-Fi Shop, for instance, it's a smaller organization, so we could do things that they can't do here because of bureaucracy. When we went to a crime scene, we would have an investigator, we would have a crime scene specialist, and we would have an attorney. So we would know from the beginning to the end what we needed, and we could work here no. The investigators come and keep out the crime lab till they're through, then the crime lab comes and they don't talk to the investigators and, and the attorneys never get involved until several weeks later and it causes fiasco. It could be handled a lot better. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Mark Hacking, were you involved in that at all? No. No? Okay. So I finally found one that you missed. <laughs> now, which one was that? Remind me. He was the one, he murdered his yes. wife. The only way we got involved on that is uh, one of our guys found the body in the dump. Oh, yeah, that was terrible. But no, we didn't get involved in it. Okay. I think that was the sheriff, if I recall. I can't remember. But yeah, I don't didn't. remember. Okay. Well, once again, George Throckmorton, thank you for this interesting, fascinating look into, into Mark Hoffman. And like I said, I might have to call you again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for letting me be here. All right. You're supposed to say cut. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with George Throckmorton. It was really fun. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks, George. And I, I really, it was a lot of fun.
For those of you who are interested in a transcript of the entire interview, go to gospeltangents.com slash shop, and, you, and I, I will send you one right away. I'm going to let our next guest introduce herself. I'm Sandra Tanner. And can you tell us, are you famous or infamous in Mormon history? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that short clip from our next interview. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please go to our patreon.com slash gospel tangents and subscribe for just $5 a month. If you'd like a transcript of this, please click the yellow subscribe button at gospeltangents.com and I'll send you this and all future transcripts. Also, if you'd like a paperback like we've got here, those are available at our website at amazon.com. Just do a search for Gospel Tangents. Please get all updates at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. You can also get transcripts individually at our website, gospeltangents.com slash shop. Finally, make sure that you subscribe on our Apple Podcast page. Just do a quick search for uh, Gospel Tangents there and give us a five-star review while you're at it. Thanks again for listening. Your support helps create more Mormon history classes and podcasts such as this. And so I really appreciate you listening. Please share with your friends. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our great videos. Thanks again.